We have the founder um, of the board list, uh, a, a, a woman I've known now for quite some time, who is very focused on, um, on changing the composition of boards. So I want you to please join me in welcoming Sukinder Singh Cassidy, founder of the board list. Thank you, John. Hey, everyone. How are you? And uh, thank you again for having me, John. I'm super excited to be here. And I've heard the first couple of days are a very hard act to follow. Um, but I do think the conversation has been teed up for me in many ways, because I understand corporate governance and boards has been the subject of a lot of conversation over the last couple of days, uh, which is no surprise. So just before I get started, by show of hands, how many of you sit on any kind of board? do any kind of board work, so uh, at least 50% of the audience. And I presume for the remainder of the audience, our boards of interest is something you would like to serve on, or do you feel like boards are places you interact as an executive? I presume the answer is yes. Um, so what I want to do in the next uh, effectively 12 to 15 minutes is really talk to you about how to be a better board. You'll understand I didn't say build a better board. I started with be a better board. Because you can't talk about board building without also talking about governance. And it doesn't matter if you build the world's most diverse board if you don't do the job that you're there for. And as I've sort of you know, played out my career on both public, private, and nonprofit boards, I think it's kind of been amazing to me, and particularly over the last two years since I founded the board list, just how much we need to go back to the basics of thinking about what the boardroom is all about. So let's get started. Uh, so first of all, I'm going to spend this morning on three themes. Boards 101, uh, the big idea, and a thought to leave you with. And, uh, and hopefully all three will invoke some thinking and uh, maybe a different perspective, or maybe back to the fundamentals uh, of board building. So why does this matter? Well, we all know board ne boardrooms need to change, right? No surprise, this has been the topic of conversation over the last couple of days. By the way, it's not just diversity and the need for diverse skills. It's the fact that we have activists looking at board tenure and the lack of board governance. We have digital disruption. We have a whole new class of consumers called millennials. We have scandal. Unfortunately, all of these things, or fortunately, all of these things together are creating an impetus for the first time in a long time for boardrooms to change. But what does that mean, and how do we begin that conversation? Well, I want to begin it actually not with the topic of diversity, but with something more fundamental. So my first key message for you is that boards are failing today because they fail to do the fundamentals well. So like topic number one, what does it mean to run a great boardroom? Right. When I reflect on being an operator inside the boardroom, and for all of you who have been operators inside a boardroom, what are we told when we enter a boardroom? Well, you don't enter a boardroom as an operator with your operator hat on, right? You are supposed to come and influence because you know your job isn't to be the person running the show. You're not part of the management team. You're there to help guide the company. But in one fundamental respect, boards really need to get to their act together in a way that operators uniquely know. And boards need to start running far more disciplined, far more like operators do in a Couple of key con in a couple of key ways that could entirely change the way boards operate today. So as an operator, the reason I find myself frustrated sometimes sitting in a boardroom is not because I want to be on the management team, but because I want the boardroom to run with the same discipline and thoughtfulness with which we build our management teams and run our management teams in order to create the most effective companies. And I would argue the first place we are failing in the boardroom is failing at the fundamentals. So. At the most basic level, we spend a lot of time right, talking about diversity, a lot of time. If you just reverse that question, why are we talking about diversity? Because how can you run any company or group effectively if you don't have the needed skills and perspectives present? So when we look at most private boardrooms, they lack an independent. When we look at most public boardrooms, they lack diversity of multiple types. When we look at the average tenure of boards, we have two complete extremes. We have public boards who fail to turn over their boardrooms rapidly enough to really change out the skills that are needed for the company's next three to five years. And when we look at private boardrooms, they have no idea of what tenure should look like at all. In fact, many people are afraid to put somebody in the boardroom as an independent because they are worried whether that person will be relevant in three or five years. I mean, we have two extremes, yet neither do the fundamentals well of putting together a group of people whose skills and perspectives are relevant to the next one to three to five years of a company. 
So for how many of you in the room do you feel like you sit on a board where the boardroom has inside of it the skills and diversity of skills needed for the company's next one to three years? Put up your hand. Okay, lesson number one. If you're sitting in a boardroom and it is lacking the skills and perspectives needed, as a board member, what is your job? Speak up. <laughs> Speak up. If you have a founder on the one hand who is afraid to put an independent in the boardroom, speak up. Talk about what a board term should look like. Is it one year, two years, three years, five years? It doesn't matter. That skill needs to be there. If you're in a public boardroom and somebody is looking to you for an answer and everyone looks at each other and no one has the answer, your job as a board member is to pose the question about what skills are missing in the boardroom. The average tenure of the person in the boardroom is nine years. Your job is to say, <laughs> you know, we're missing people from this conversation. And by the way, this is like the basics. This is management 101. Do you have the skills and the leadership necessary in the room to do the job? Number two, are you having the right discussion? <laughs> Interestingly, when we think about the right discussions, today there is a plethora of things that boards aren't really clear on whether, they're whether or not they have responsibility towards those things. Number one. You know, besides the metrics of success and growth, is culture an area of oversight that the board should have any thesis on? What do you think? How many people here believe that culture is an area that the board should have oversight on? How many people today believe your boards have the mandate to have that conversation? How many people feel like you have the mandate and the infrastructure and the metrics to have it consistently? Exactly. Right? Culture is just one example of, a, of the question of whether or not boardrooms are having the right discussions. Right? The, other, the others are actually far more fundamental. You need access to information. You need access to the metrics of the business. You, know, you need the ability to have a clear and constructive debate. Right? Seems obvious. Let's continue. Clear decision making. How does decision making get made in your boardrooms? How many people exist in boardrooms today Whereas there is plenty of debate and a lack of conclusion. Any of you have that problem? Any of you sit in boardrooms where you talk about the same thing again, board meeting after board meeting, yet nobody is really clear what the conclusion is? Right. <laughs> so when we think about, think about this inside of a management team. If you were running a team of any, any kind and you didn't know how decisions were getting made, implicitly, explicitly, who's responsible for making them? Would we consider that a well-run organization? Yet in the boardroom, we spend all of this time amassing great talent, not clear if we are having the right discussions, not clear if we're giving right access to right information, and even kind of discussing explicitly the mandate of the board. And up from that, not clear how decisions get made. Right? And then at the last, in the top, of course, is performance management and accountability bi-directionally. This means, and once again, if we went from the extreme of public boards to private boards, you know, I'll juxtapose them both. This means at its most basic level, is the CEO being held accountable for the, for the performance of the company? Is the boardroom being held responsible for its job in providing stewardship and guidance? Right. In how many of your boardrooms does the CEO get a formal and consistent review? Four hands went up. Four hands went up. In how many of your boardrooms do you, as board members, get 360 feedback consistently? One hand. One hand. So let's just think about that. Doing the fundamentals well. Boardroom management 101. How many of you now believe that your boardrooms are running at their most effective? How many of you believe you sit inside boardrooms that are as well run as you look to the CEO to run the company? So when we talk about boards, we can talk about the most advanced ideas. We can talk about cybersecurity and blockchain and risk management and digital disruption. But if you don't do the fundamentals well, we can't expect a great result. 
So of course this comes to one obvious question. Who's leading the boardroom? Who is leading the boardroom? How many of you sit on private company boards? How many of those private company boards have a lead independent? Okay, two. How many of them have a chairman who is distinct from the CEO? Two. In how many cases are your boardrooms led by the CEO? And by the way, I've been a founder CEO. I am a founder CEO, so you know, I put myself in that class having been the chairman of my own boards, and I'm the chairman of the board at the, at the board list. But in any event, in a public companies in the US, what you would find is the vast majority of the time, the CEO is also the chairman. In Europe, by the way, this is almost never the case. Right? I sit on the board of Ericsson, where in fact the CEO is not allowed to be the chairman of the board. Right? He is distinctly not allowed. That, that role has been mandated to be separated. But in any event, I would come back to the, the, the most startling observation I've had on boards over the last 10 years that I've served is that you can put together the most brilliant group of people, but unless they are led effectively, you will not have an effective boardroom. So when we talk about the things I showed you on the previous slide, how do those get solved if you're an operator? Somebody leads, right? Do any of you, I presume most of the people in the room lead a team of some kind, right? Is that fair to say? And you work really hard to amass the right talent? So let's presume you're the leader of that group or the leader of that team. How many of you ever left the room and given your team a task and been frustrated when, when you get back, the collected kind of brainstorming session or whatever task you've given them comes back of poorer quality than you'd expect for the team you just put in the room? Why? Because when you leave a really talented group of people together, no matter how talented, if there is not someone leading or facilitating, you do not get the best out of that team. So what's the challenge when you have the CEO and the chairman role in one role together? What's the, what's the obvious issue with that? And I say this, and it pains me as a founder to say it, by the way. It pains me as a founder. <laughs> right? The obvious issue is the only lens in the boardroom is the lens of the CEO. If the CEO is the chair, all information comes through that lens. That's great in peacetime. Is it good in wartime? Is it good in times of challenge and disruption? Right. Is it right to have only one lens into the boardroom? Or is the board's job to provide, again, diverse perspectives gathered together into a whole that helps guide the company? So as you sit here today, before we move off this topic, one of the things I want you all as board members or aspiring board members or people who work in the boardroom to do is to go back and challenge yourself in your boardrooms to figure out who is leading that boardroom dynamic, and how do you make it more effective? Because I'd argue today, leaving this to an implicit play out of whatever the CEO's agenda is, <laughs> um, you know, hoping that one of the venture capitalists in the room steps up because they have a bigger ownership perspective and will take a perspective beyond you know, their own position for all shareholders. Right? Hoping that someone's going to play a leadership role, in fact, doesn't make it happen. So, if you want to be a better board, find leadership in the boardroom, identify who it is, and commit yourself to the fundamentals of building a great team together. So I'm going to go on uh, to two bigger ideas, having sort of talked about boardroom fundamentals. So of course, you know, we can talk about the boardroom and the things that need to shift in the boardroom and in companies if we want to see change. But I think most people would fundamentally agree that boardrooms are about power. Any disagreement with that? Boardrooms are about power, right, fundamentally. But what is the bigger idea with regard to power in boardrooms? And this comes not just to being a better board, but building a better board. Well, the fundamental issue with boardrooms today is that people see power as a finite resource. Managing a boardroom historically has been a power play. <laughs> it's about who is in control, right? Who is in control? That is the way boardrooms run. But let's step back to a bigger idea. Is power a finite resource? Should boardrooms run on that dynamic that if one person has power, everybody else is powerless? No. Because the key insight and the way boardrooms will advance, the way diversity will advance, the way it all advances is by starting to think about power and how to use power not as a finite resource, 
but as an infinite resource. So what do I mean by that? So I think many of you know that I'm here because I'm the founder of The Board List, which is a platform uh, that allows leaders with board experience to nominate diverse talent for boards. And then those people in turn are discovered as companies are looking for a new and emerging talent to once again kind of re-energize and, and help shift the boardroom. But what's our key insight at The Board List? That at the end of the day, it works on a fundamental principle. That people who have power, i.e. they're sitting in boardrooms, they are in whatever club you consider to, to hold board members, and they refer talent who then gets discovered for boards. Why do they do it? They do it because in turn, once that person gets their first board seat, they feel great, they feel an emotional and social response and reward to helping put somebody else into power. So it turns out that the most powerful people in the world, you know, enjoy one thing that the rest of us all need to appreciate. It's not that they enjoy holding power, it's that they in fact get energy from sharing power. Boardrooms will change if we stop thinking about it as a place where things need to be controlled and power needs to be controlled and start thinking about the, uh, boardrooms, about ourselves, about ourselves as board members or aspiring board members or people in any position of leadership as people who have the ability not only to become powerful, but in fact to share power. So as you think about a kind of a big idea for today, look, the basic idea is get the board fundamentals right. Doing the fundamentals well will actually build a great boardroom. But above that, if you want to become someone who helps change the nature of how boards work and how companies work, you need to shift from a perspective of thinking that it's all about harnessing power for yourself and it's about starting to share power with others. And in fact, the more power you share, the more power you get, right? It's the fundamental lesson of the board list. The more power you share, the more power you get, right? Because power multiplies. It turns out it's not an infinite, it's not a finite resource, it's an infinite resource. And so I want you to think about as a bigger idea, whether you're in the boardroom today or not, if you're in the boardroom, how do you move from being feeling powerful to letting power flow? To whom are you going to let power flow? How do you start to share power in a way that it will come back to you and to everybody else in the boardroom or in your management team or in any leadership circle that you run, you know, multiplied? And the last two things I want, ideas I want to leave you with are these, right? When we think about sharing power, with whom do we naturally think about sharing power? Those in our network, right? I mean, I love the board list, right? I was the founder. I love it because I think about smart and amazing women I know, and I refer them to the board list all the time. And when they get a board seat, I do feel, in fact, the reward and the excitement um, of seeing somebody else who's great rise to a position of power and influence. But I do it very naturally within my network. That's a great thing, right? It is, but there's only one thing that is better than sharing power naturally within your network. Any ideas what it is? What happens when you share power within your network? Right. So today, I benefit from the fact that I'm am, I am putting together amazing women on the board list, who in turn, by the way, are my power endorsers and who bring other women. Right. On the one hand, that's great, and I can pat myself on the back. On the other hand, what I've also realized as I've been on this journey over the past two years is that if my network looks like this, there's also a problem with it. So if there's a last idea to leave you with as we come off the topic of boards and being better board members and building and sharing power, it's this. In fact, it's true that for all of us, myself included, the work doesn't stop when you share power with people in your network. Because if you're like many of the people in the room and you are a one percenter, Power doesn't flow very far. Right. So what, do, what is the true opportunity for power? What is the true opportunity for power flow and power sharing? It's to create a true opportunity for access. And, the, and that means for every one of us, we are going to have to be far more deliberate about thinking about how we share power and let power flow with people who are not the obvious people in our network. 
but to reach to the farthest points of our network and maybe beyond our network to find opportunities to let others with who really have the opportunity to inclusion really access power as well. So three big ideas. Do the fundamentals well. Boardrooms win when boardrooms are led and managed well. Number two, if you are in any kind of position where you think all day about amassing power or being powerful, shift your thinking. Start to think about how you share and let power flow to others, and you will create change in any organization you lead, inside the boardroom or out. And lastly, when you think about those you share power with, look beyond your obvious networks and think about creating a true opportunity for power flow and inclusion five generations out from where you are today. Thanks so much.